Okay, so uh, our final talk of the morning will be given by Shay. Um, so uh, I'll just start by thanking the Fash uh, for inviting me first to this excellent workshop. Uh, really enjoyed all the talks. Shay. Speak up. Okay, cool, no problem. Um, so uh, I realize you're probably getting tired after the morning's talks and have one eye on lunch, so I try to keep this as pleasant as possible. Um, <laughs> I think for the non-quantum of money, actually they're probably out there now, uh, this should also be accessible. So uh, this is, um, this is uh, joint work with um, Tobias Fritz from Barcelona. Uh, so as you can see, the title of the talk is Hardy's Non-Locality Paradox and Other Possibilistic Bell Inequalities. Uh, so, at least uh, one person here should be familiar with this paradigm <laughs> due to him. Um, I'll talk about it in a moment later. Um, so, uh, for those of you that are familiar with um, Hardy's paradox, his possibilistic arguments, uh, inequalities might seem a bit strange. But, uh, don't jump on this just yet. I'm really interested. Um, so I want to just begin with a little bit of motivation for why we're looking at this and um, tell you about the results that we can show. Um, so first of all, we know that quantum mechanics uh, cannot be extended to a local realist theory. So, uh, local realism, what exactly do I have in mind when I say this? Uh, so, just uh, very roughly, deal with these properties in more detail shortly. But very roughly, by locality, I mean that something that I do here and now shouldn't instantaneously affect things in the Andromeda galaxy or something like this. And by realism, I mean that systems have properties uh, even when those properties are not being measured or observed. So this is uh, this uh, brings to mind the, the kind of famous question about um, is the moon there when no one is looking? This, this kind of stuff. So these are things that intuitively we feel that we should have in our description of the world, but um, in quantum mechanics this is not the case. So originally uh, we knew this due to the work of, uh, of John Bell, and the usual way of demonstrating it is to consider spatially separated systems, uh, and at each site you can perform measurements, and you get outcomes from these measurements, and you have a joint probability distribution on these outcomes. Now, under the assumptions of locality and realism, Bell was able to show that correlations of these outcomes should obey certain inequalities. Uh, these are the, the famous Bell inequalities. But in quantum mechanics, we can violate these things. Um, and we can even ex experimentally demonstrate that these, these, uh, these inequalities are violated. So this is how it, it was first done, it was usually done. But um, later on, there were other arguments um, that were slightly different in flavor, uh, possibly to be more, more intuitive. Uh, so one argument was due to this uh, Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger group, uh, and another due to Lucy. Um, and these differ in that we don't really care about what exactly the probabilities are for these joint outcomes. We only need to know whether a joint outcome is possible or impossible. So this is what I call a, a, a possibilistic non-locality proof, and that's what that's what we want to look at here. So uh, what we did is we set up a, a framework for looking at such non-locality proofs, uh, which is very similar to um, Samson's relational hidden variable. Uh, models or Samson's relational empirical models uh, from this paper of last year. This is very similar to it. And um, so, more precisely, what we consider are NK Bell, Bell scenarios. Uh, so, these numbers refer to things. Uh, this is the number of parties involved. So, what I talk about, the row is going to be two parties, house and bottom. Measurement, uh, 
us our outcomes? Uh, yes. And no, I didn't realize, are they forced to do exactly k or less than or equal to k? Uh, so strictly speaking, you can, you can, one of them can do less than k. Uh, we can cater for that situation. Um, okay, so these are the kinds of uh, scenarios that we consider. And then there are a number of things that we can show. Um, first of all, uh, we show that the Hardy paradox is remarkably universal in the scenarios. Um, so, in fact, in 2L, 2K, 2 scenarios, um, the Hardy paradox is, is the only way that we can get uh, non local behavior. And uh, you, if you think about this, you, you, might, uh, you might find a way of contradicting me here by saying that well, we can have just no signaling behavior. But Actually, I will show up in a while that we can include no signaling uh, in Hardy type of the uh, So, this is the next thing. So, we show that in some students, no signaling. Finally, we show that these are not completely universal. So, uh, in particular, we can present a new paradox.
So they perform very many runs of this experiment. And afterwards, they tabulate their results. So we just make a table of the results. So we have Alice over here. tells us this. Secondly, um, if one got up, the other never got The other color must have been So this is the apparent paradox. <laughs> All right. So we've snuck in some assumptions here, particularly in this step. The assumptions are locality and uh, and realism. So we've assumed locality, and we've assumed that the measurement that Bob makes doesn't affect which outcome Alice gets. So this is our, our locality assumption. And we've also assumed realism in that we've assumed that the property of color uh, makes makes sense to talk about even when it's not being measured. So these, these are how these things get stuck in here. Um, okay, so this is this is the, the paradox. Now I want to make a, a couple, of, couple of points about this. Uh, So, uh, first of all, if we want to avoid the occurrence of this, of this paradox, the paradox in the table here, we can write a condition for that. And the condition takes the form of a horn formula. Um, so that looks like this. So P is the possibility value, which is 0 or 1. So we say um, this is one, then it implies that one of the other entries that are written in the table has to be one. So okay. So we have this. 
this horn formula for the, the non-occurrence of this kind of uh, unusual behavior. And of course, this isn't this isn't the only uh, <coughs> paradox of this type here. We actually have 64 of them we allow for uh, different placings of the ones and different placings of the zeros. So we can swap the measurement columns and the gap columns and so on. So they're, they're formally the same. Uh, it's just up to symmetries and so on. Yeah. Um, so if we satisfy these, uh, if we satisfy these hard formulas, then we know that there is there is no 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 behavior in this kind. Now, um, <laughs> interestingly, uh, so we can also write these as as uh, um, inequalities in booleans. So here we are. write this as an inequality. Uh, this is strange uh, if you're familiar with um, uh, the Hardy paradox and so on because it, it's it's uh, a proof of non-locality without inequalities. You don't need to uh, talk about the Bell inequalities. So here we have recovered inequalities but they're a different kind of inequality because we have Boolean inequalities. So it's a kind of, uh, again, a form of similarity that um, collaborators particularly keen to uh, all right. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about this for now. I'm going to. Sorry, Andrew. So this is triple equality. Yeah. Is, you would embed the left hand side and the right hand side. But what do you mean? Can can describe the both settings? Or? Um. So. Um, yeah. If this is sign, which you mean it's equivalent to between the two, uh, the Boolean algebra zero one. The probability is. Yes. It's the same structure. It's a nice amount. Oh, it's the same structure. I thought you had the interval on the right hand side, but it still has such a one. Okay. It's an equality, it's not a nice morphism, it's the same thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Um, Alright, so that's what I wanted to say about uh, the Hardy Paradox, just for now. What I want to talk about are properties of, of um, empirical models. Uh, so just to set, set up what properties that models have after we do the results. signaling says is that Alice's outcome is independent Bob's measurement choice. consider Alice and Bob as being different laboratories, which might be separated by vast, vast distance. And we think that um, the choice of measurement that Bob makes can instantaneously affect things so that Alice's outcomes change in her lab, then this, this, uh, this kind of goes against our, our relativistic, uh, relativistic notions that you know, there's, there's a minimum time that it takes for effects to properly. Um, 
But what does what does this uh, what does this property look like in the tabular form that I'm, I'm using here? So the tabular form is particularly useful um, just for showing things. Uh, so what does it look like? It says that if we have some one in the table, uh, let's say one here. All right. So it's possible for Alice to measure up. Bob measures polarization, then it should also be possible for Alice to measure up when Bob measures color. Okay? So there must be a one in either this place or this place. So that's how the no signaling property looks in the tables. It's just a nice kind of intuition to get into your minds. Um, similarly, for Bob, we, we for no signaling. used uh, in his relation of hidden variables paper, uh, which I think is quite, quite nice. Um, so basically what weak determinism says is that there is a unique to measure polarization and block tries to measure color, there should be a unique one somewhere in here as well. So we just have a uh, unique one in, in the boxes. Okay, this is weak determinism. Strong determinism is the conjunction of the previous two properties. same rows and columns where possible. So we can't have this. This is not strongly deterministic. Right? Um, this one doesn't have... So for this one, for it to be no signaling, we need to have a one here and here. We don't have that. So strong deterministic models would look something like this. Where we have a, a one, a one, a one, and one, for example. And then finally, I want to talk about a class of models that I call the local realist models. Okay. Um, so, uh, for local realist models, we want to allow for the situation where, for each run of the experiment, the system is in some strong deterministic state. But that strong deterministic state might be different for each row. Okay, so for some of the runs it might be like this, and for some of the runs it might be like, uh, like this. Okay, so we want to allow for situations like this. In fact, we want to allow for mixing. Uh, so what we do is we, we take unions of the models, but in the tabular form, what that looks like is uh, we have to take a union of these two. Just put ones in, in the place where there's in places where there is a one in either either table. So here it looks like this. All right. This is so, again. So you're talking 
about each one, but you write down just one thing. Um, yes, so for, for each room, it's possible that um, if you think about a concrete setting, a photon is in a different, is in a different state, uh, but it, each state is strongly deterministic. So overall, when we tabulate the results afterwards, the table would look something like this. If some of the time it was uh, in this, and some of the time it was in this. So I call the local realist models any any models that can be obtained by mixing strong deterministic ones. Um, so in particular, a model is local realist if and only if every one in the table, sorry, I'm just thinking in terms of the type of representation, if every one be completed <coughs> to a strong deterministic uh, rectangle of ones, or if we're dealing with more measurement settings, I call these things grids. Okay, so a strong deterministic. So that's all I wanted to say about uh, properties of empirical models. So now I'll just I'll talk to you a bit about the, the, the results, the universality results that we have. First, when I say universality here, I think mean universality categories. Uh, okay, so. In terms of results, uh, we're going to we're going to start small. So we're going to start by looking at two, two, two scenarios. Um, the Hardy paradox that I described to you was a two-two-two scenario. Okay, we had two parties, Alice and Bob. Each of them could perform two measurements. They were measuring uh, polarization and color, and each measurement had two outcomes. Okay, so that's an example of a two-two-two scenario. Uh, what we can show for these scenarios is that no signaling together with the property of not having a Hardy paradox, which I'll write as uh, an H, is equivalent to local realism. <coughs> First of all, we know that um, that local realism, by definition, can't have signaling behavior. So local realism implies no signaling straight off. And also, uh, from the argument that I gave when I talked about the Hardy paradox, we know that local realism isn't compatible with, with the Hardy paradox. So this this direction is, is easy. What we do need to talk about is the forward direction. Okay, 
so um, we assume that the that the model is no signaling and has no highly fired bus, and we show that it's, it must be both a realist because we show that it satisfies this bound. So we take an arbitrary one in the table, uh, it could be a one anywhere, but we just rearrange the table, we rearrange the, the rows and columns of measurements and the rows and columns of outcomes just so that we can write the one up. Here. So it's, it's okay to do this, so we can do it with that less of generality. Um, Okay, by no signaling, we know that there's a 1 in one of these places. Uh, again, if, if it, uh, we, we can arrange to just switch rows and columns so that that 1 is here. So we can do that again without loss of generality and that goes for here. So by no signaling, we need to have these 1s. Alright, so now we look at this place. If there's a 1 here, then um, what we started with completes to a strong deterministic uh, rectangle. And we're done. If not, if this is a zero, then we have to be careful to avoid the Hardy paradox. So remember the Hardy paradox, uh, we had a Hardy paradox for this one if there was a zero here and a zero here. So this can't be the case. The horn formula tells us actually that we need to have a one in one of these, in these places. So uh, in, in either one of these places, um, uh, these places, let's say, up here. Okay, but then we can uh, use no signaling again to just complete complete the argument. So no signaling for this one means that there must be one here, and then we have our we have our. Okay, so by assuming no signaling, there's no already paradox, we can show that the model must be local. Things you get a bunch of other things. Sure, yeah. 
So, um, okay, so, so that's it. That's how you get all of these. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. that's very nice. Right. Okay. Um, so, this is a nice result, and this, this holds true in the two, two, two scenarios. But we wanted to see if we could extend this further, and actually we can. So, the next thing we consider are two, two, L scenarios. So, um, here we still have two parties, and they can still perform two measurements, but now the measurements are much richer, they can, uh, they can get a, a whole wealth of other outcomes. So, um, uh, let me see. In these situations, we consider coarse grains of what I presented to you as the Hardy paradox. Okay, so we have tables that look like this. Okay, now we have, we have very many uh, outcomes for each measurement. Okay, so that, that is arbitrary. Um, all right. So by coarse graining of the Hardy paradox, just so that you uh, probably not familiar with these things, um, the original one that I presented to you, in the two, two, two. Okay, so just like this. Here, the coarse graining is going to uh, look like this. So if I have a one here, uh, I can have a bunch of, a bunch of ones here, a bunch of zeros. Is that too small or can everyone see it? Is it? Okay. And I have a bunch of ones here, a bunch of zeros. Okay. So I say that if this table in here, this, this kind of uh, sub-matrix or whatever, uh, if this contains all zeros, then I call this a coarse screen and paradox. Okay. So I, I mean it's, it's formally the same same as here, it's just we've, uh, we've allowed for uh, coarse screen for reference. It's very different. Right, so probably because I've written in the ones explicitly here. Here we also need to have ones right here. Um, right, okay, so we get a whole load of these things. Um, if I say there are one of these ones here, two of these ones here, um, then we get a uh, different. Uh, different coarse graining, so I call, I call this uh, H into for a coarse grain Hardy paradox with, with these kind of characteristic numbers. And um, again, for the non occurrence of it, I'll just I'll write this as H into. Okay, so uh, these are the coarse gradings that we can see. Now, there are some interesting cases with this, with this coarse grain, um, which were kind of uh, unusual, uh, we thought were unusual when we came across them. Um, first of all, you'll notice that no signaling is actually equivalent to the property of NH. So, um, so signaling is when we have when we take a one in the table, and there's there's no one uh, over here in the other box, and there's no one over here in the other box, uh, down here in the other box. So when these numbers m one and m two go to zero. So by looking at this coarse grain version of the Hardy paradox, we actually get no signaling as a kind of degenerate case. So uh, I thought that was quite nice when you came across it. And then um, another point that I'm just throwing as an aside is that NH L is equivalent to measurement locality, which is this uh, property that was in Samson's paper. Um, and, um, measurement locality means that the, the measurement that one experimenter makes should not affect the measurement that one 
That's that's more as an insight. But what what I'd like to um, talk about is whether the result put, that we had for two 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 scenarios actually pushes through when we expand the amount of outcomes that we're allowed to have. And in fact, it does. So the result that we get in the two two L scenario is this overall. general way of writing the result that I wrote in the in the two 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 case. I could actually I could actually write this now uh, just as I did over there. Okay. Uh, so that's the the two two L case. Um, the next thing is the the two K two K two case. Okay, so this time uh, we stick with uh, measurements that can have binary outcomes, but we allow there to be an arbitrary number of measurements. And in fact, we find that the same result holds in this case as well. How am I doing for time with this? There's about 15 minutes. Um, right, I, I, think, I think I'm going to skip the proof of this actually. Uh, this is, this is Yes, I do. So, so while I skip the proof, I, I will explain to you how to find this, right? So you're, you're very right. Uh, tables that look like this are using very many measurements for each party. Okay, so in this situation, uh, we say that uh, it has the property of, of n nh whatever if um, if every two by two subtable so if we choose two measurement settings from Alice and two measurement settings from Bob we can get a sub mod this is a two by two this has a two by two table so if every two by two sub model has the property nh whatever then we say that the <coughs> then we say that the larger model has that property as well very likely, but it would work for 2k, k5. That it would work for 2k, 2kl. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't. <laughs> interestingly, it doesn't work for the counting. So I think it's useful yeah. to see that when you say that everyone can be completed to agree, we can also uh, basically what you could be there is that for any sub table, you can complete to agree, and can complete to agree as well. Yes. So, that's, uh, so that, I mean, this is a kind of a, yeah. a very rough outline of the, yeah. the proof. So. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll skip the proof of this. I'll, I'll spare you the uh, spare you the details. But um, suffice to say that the result actually pushes through to this case as well. So um, we have it for all two K two scenarios, K greater than equal to two, and we have it for all two two L scenarios. And then the next uh, obvious question uh, that Jacob created is to, to see what happens in the 2KL scenario where, where we allow both of these numbers to increase. Briefly, 
Um, in this kind of scenario, uh, we have we have ladder paradoxes. Um, so I think um, I think the ladder paradoxes, as you um, originally proposed them, were probably uh, they were two K two scenarios. And so um, in tables like this, the ladder paradox looks. It, it, it already has a similarity to the, the Hardy paradox when you look at the table from it. The table is similar to like this. Alright, so you kind of have a, a ladder effect of these zeros. Um, so, this is the ladder paradox for 2K2 scenario. And similarly to what I've, I showed for coarse graining, the Hardy paradox, you can coarse grain this one. So uh, we can consider if all of the coarse grains have it in the two KL scenarios. Um, so well, what we can show, which is actually quite easy to show, is that the occurrence of a ladder paradox um, of which there are many more than there are hardy paradoxes. Um, the occurrence of the latter paradox implies the occurrence scenarios it's not universal. Okay, so it's been completely universal up to this point, but now it's not. And in fact, uh, well, we can show this by kind of for example. that we've gotten to, and there are a number of, uh, there are a number of uh, 
open questions kind of remaining to be talked about. Um, particularly, I think it's interesting to say that we're talking about empirical models here, we're talking about correlation tables and so on. Um, we're not explicitly talking about quantum mechanics. But the interesting thing is that we know that the Hardy paradox and the latter paradoxes are realizable in quantum mechanics. So I'm curious to, to know if this table is actually realizing the quantum mechanics. That's something that I need, to, I need to think about. Also, I don't know if this is the only if this is the only other kind of uh, paradox that I can get in this, uh, or if I can get families of paradoxes as I go on and so on. Um, right, and then just uh, one final point. I was talking to. Uh, so just one final point, something that I want to point out as being uh, quite nice in what we've done here. Um, in talking about local realist models, we've kind of um, we've gone around having to talk about hidden variables in this situation, uh, which is a, a very nice feature of this, I think, and Samson and I were talking about it last night. And, uh, this, this is something that's probably deserving a little bit more. So that's my final concluding remark. Thanks.
the uh, scattered stuff so have done some work on this, but uh, it's actually it's kind of challenging. sold on the importance of the, of the um, hospitalistic reasoning. But you can show it you know, that's a quick way of getting to yes. probabilistic. Thank you. 